Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Tron and uh, to our morning service here, which will begin in just a moment. Perhaps you'd join me for these last moments as the musicians will play and as we have a, an opportunity quietly to pray together, to prepare our hearts to hear God's word and to respond with all of our hearts. The Apostle Paul tells us that God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every knee on earth and heaven, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Well, let's begin by singing a hymn that reminds us of this great truth. It's number 320 in these blue books, which you have on your seats. Name of all majesty, fathomless mystery, king of the ages by angels adored. Number 320.
Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. We bow, O God, in the name of all majesty, of all glory, and of all power. And how glad we are to come to you, our Father, through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, the one in whom you showed your extraordinary, deep, fathomless love in sending him into a world of rebellion, of such hatred, of such defiance of your holy name, sending him to be a savior, to face not only the wrath of man so resistant to the lordship of heaven, but to bear for us the wrath of God himself, to bear our punishment, our penalty, that we might be forgiven, that we might be washed clean in your sight through him, through the great God become our Savior and the person of God the Son. Lord, the wonder of that costliest victory of darkness defeated and Eden restored consumes our minds and our hearts with wonder and with praise. And yet even it is better than Eden restored for surely in Christ we have more blessings even than our father Adam lost. We have become not only your creatures, your friends, your image, but your very own sons and daughters in Christ, adopted into your own family to share with him the love of the Father's household, to know him and his joy forever and ever. And so we rejoice, Lord, in the blessing of belonging to our Lord Jesus Christ the joy and the wonder of your great redeeming love. But how we need your help. How greatly, Lord, we need the help of your Holy Spirit day by day and week by week to guard us, to lead us in the way everlasting. So easily we err, so quickly we turn away from your gracious rule from your way of peace, from your paths of righteousness. We know our hearts are wayward ever. And so we come this day seeking your help, asking you to speak your word of life and power into our hearts to strengthen us, to equip us, to challenge and correct us, to comfort us, to encourage us, and to lead us in your way. And so we pray, keep, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy church, with thy perpetual mercy. And because the frailty of man without thee cannot but fall, keep us ever by thy help from all things hurtful, and lead us to all things profitable to our salvation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed to all of you this morning, very especially if you're visiting with us. And if it's your first time here in the Tron, you're very welcome indeed. If you're a new student who's come to Glasgow and uh, you're just finding your way around the city, we're also very glad to see you. And uh, in a moment, uh, one of uh, those in our student team is going to say something about uh, student welcome after the service today. But first, let me just draw your attention to these uh, sheets. I hope you have one on your seat or somewhere around. And uh, if you open them up, you will see that there are numbers of notices there for the church uh, family in the coming week. You'll see the middle panel there, all the things happening this week as usual. Please note, Wednesday is our congregational prayer meeting. And uh, if you're new to the church, if you're a new student before all our student work and so on uh, starts up, if you want to find out about the real heart of the life of our church, come along on Wednesday evening at 7.30. You'll hear who we pray for. You'll hear about our uh, mission partners around the world. you get a feel for the church family at prayer. 
So please do come along and join us as uh, in that most important time uh, we pray for the Lord's work throughout the world and uh, also here in our own fellowship. Notice on the right-hand side uh, uh, the uh, meeting uh, on Saturday the 26th, a celebration of 150 years of the Overseas Missionary Fellowship, formerly the China Inland Mission. And uh, that's a great opportunity to hear not only about the past but about the future and the many opportunities there are uh, serving Christ in Southeast Asia today. Come and hear Scott Murray and others pre uh, speaking, uh, and uh, it will be a day of real encouragement. Also, I think everybody has this morning, as I mentioned last week, one of these leaflets from the Barnabas Fund. Uh, we're very much aware, aren't we, of the refugee crisis uh, that's uh, uh, happening at the moment. And um, one of the very particular needs is for those uh, with a Christian background fleeing from Syria. One of the great scandals, I think, uh, of our European nations today is that hardly a single European nation is willing to make a particular effort uh, to help Christians who are fleeing real persecution uh, from these lands. You'll see if you read the leaflet that Poland is one of those that is, and uh, the Barnabas Fund has a particular project helping to bring people not through dangerous uh, boats across the Mediterranean, but through safe channels uh, from the land of Syria into Poland and other places. And uh, if you want to help with that, and if you want to make a contribution to this current crisis, uh, my recommendation is that you read these leaflets and uh, you use that as a, a very uh, trustworthy way uh, of making sure that your money uh, will go to help people that you want to help. So I leave those with you. Do read them and uh, make use of those uh, if you can. Uh, Andy, why don't you come and uh, tell us about students? Good morning, everyone. My name's Andy. I'm one of the ministry apprentices here at the Tron. Um, and I just want to warmly welcome any new students or any new young workers to the city who might be with us this morning. Um, as a church, we just want to say that we want to get to know you and we want to meet you and make you feel welcome. And to do that, we have planned um, tea and coffee downstairs in the Glasgow room um, just to get to know you, to tell you a little bit about what church life looks like here and for you to hear a little bit about what the student and young workers um, ministry looks like um, called Release the Word. Um, so please do join us after the service. We'd really like to meet you. And afterwards, um, some church members have kindly put on meals in their houses and you'd be very welcome there as well. So thanks very much. Thanks, Andy. Well, do come and help us uh, eat up all the grub. Otherwise, we'll have some very fat members by next week. So uh, we need your help uh, in that. Sorry, just one last thing. Just th uh, this evening's service uh, will be as normal at 6.30. Uh, but if you're a Farsi speaker, then uh, you'll be meeting downstairs in the Lomond Room. And uh, we'll be having our service, uh, as usual, in translation into Farsi. So uh, if you speak Farsi, go downstairs. If you don't speak Farsi, you're probably better to stay up here. Uh, and listen to Bob file, and uh, you'll hear something you'll be able to understand. Good. Well, we're going to turn now to our Bible readings this morning, and uh, we're reading uh, again in Luke's Gospel, chapter 20. If you have one of our uh, Blue Visitor's Bibles, you'll find that on page 879. And uh, we are, we've been a long time studying Luke's Gospel, back and forward, and uh, we've just come back to study the final portion, the last section of Luke's Gospel, which um, we began last week at chapter 19, verse 28. And we're going to read this morning Luke 20, verses 1 to 19. Uh, you'll see that in our Bibles, or at least in the, in the church Bibles, uh, the paragraph heading interrupts the flow of where we're going to be. It's in the wrong place. Nothing inspired about that, paying taxes to Caesar. It just gets in the way and annoys us. So ignore that this morning. Uh, we'll read through to verse 19. One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes, the teachers of the law, uh, with the elders, came up and said to him, Tell us, by what authority do you do these things? Or who is it that gave you this authority? So he answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John the Baptist from heaven or from man? They discussed it with one another, saying, 
If we say from heaven, he will say, why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, and neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat him and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written in their own scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. Amen. May God bless to us this, his word. Well, Jesus uh, quotes to them there at the end of that reading from Psalm number 118, and we're going to sing a version of that psalm now. You'll find it at number 118 in our blue books, and please uh, notice especially the third verse that speaks of the one who was rejected, who has been resurrected, and has become the chief cornerstone. Number 118.
Well, we have uh, a few moments of quiet now as the musicians play and as our offerings for the Lord's work uh, are received. You might like to use that time to read again the passage we'll be studying in a moment, or perhaps even the psalm that we've just sung, or perhaps just to be in prayer quietly. As we do that, our offerings are received. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we are glad to come before you in the name of our Lord Jesus to bring our prayers of petition to your great and high throne. In a world of shifting sands of opinion, of politics, of economics, of social change and division, of great crises, both natural and between nations. How we thank you, O God, that we have a rock of stability and that we may come before you, the one in whose hands every issue is held and every issue belongs. Our hearts continue to be full of pain and agony and distress as we witness the great migration crisis that is happening in these days. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give in some way, not only through our prayers, but also through our substance to agencies like the Barnabas Fund that are seeking in a practical way to bring respite and relief to those who really are suffering from persecution we pray for the efforts of them and of others to rescue people of every tribe and nation and every culture and every religion. But, Lord, we are enjoined to pray especially and to help especially those of the household of faith, our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to pray very particularly this morning for those who suffer in addition to the common suffering of those in those worn, torn lands who suffer because of their profession of Christ and their allegiance to Him. We know that many, hundreds of thousands, millions of Christians have been 
dispossessed in Iraq and in Syria in particular. And we pray, Lord, for them. Meeting some of them will be today in uh, situations far less easy and peaceful than ours, perhaps in refugee camps, perhaps in homes, perhaps in hiding, meeting to gather, to encourage one another, to pray to you and to look to you for help and for sustenance. We ask for them, your grace and your mercy. We ask for them, the help of brothers and sisters around the world. We ask that you would guard and keep them. And as you have promised, show them your salvation. We pray for governments and nations as they continue to try to work out how to respond, what to do in the face of such crises, humanitarian needs to meet the human problem and distress, political interventions, and even if necessary, military inter interventions to defend and to seek to disarm some of the brutal wickedness that we are seeing perpetrated throughout some of these lands of the Middle East today with such dark and warped views of what it means to rule a people, to bring apparently a paradise, and yet what is shown to be a vile servitude, violence, corruption, and great fear. How we thank you, O oh God, for the peace and the ease and the stability which we so easily take for granted in our own nation. Forgive us, Lord, as we so quickly and easily reduce the horizons of our lives to our own little world, our own family, our own workplace, our own little social situation, <clears throat> our own church. But you have called us to be lights to this world. You have called us to be heralds of the gospel of peace to the very ends of the earth, to be involved in the march of your glorious kingdom of light in the darkness, of bringing freedom and life in the place of slavery and death. Lord, we pray that you would lift our eyes and the eyes of our hearts and the concerns of our lives above the mere mundane and the domestic. That you would lift the eyes of our church above merely ourselves, merely this city and nation, that we might truly be a people called out to shine the light of the glory of Christ all around this world until he comes to make him known to preach his glory and grace that people may hear of the name of Jesus and find in him the delight of the Father's heart, the way open to God and to his heaven, and the joy of knowing even now the indwelling of his Holy Spirit to make us temples, living homes and households of the living God. Lord, as we think of the scripture this morning, which challenges our hearts so greatly as your church, as your people, as your household, bend our knees, we pray, before you. Cause us, Lord, afresh to know what it means to be ruled by a sovereign Lord, Jesus Christ. Come to our hearts, Lord, cut out from them that which is rebellious and resistant to your rule. Open our ears that we might hear your words of challenge, your words of control over our lives and over our church. As we look to our nation, O oh God, we know that the drift that we see around us in so many ways is ultimately the fault of your church, which has so signally failed to bear fruit, so failed to be clear in proclaiming the lordship of Jesus Christ, even within the church, never mind 
extolling it to the world. And we, O oh God, are part of your household, your temple, your church, the place wherein you have chosen to dwell. And so as we gather this morning in this place, we pray that you would come to us with cleansing fire, that we might bow before you in reverence and in awe and hear your word and not merely hear it, but take it in, digest it, make it part of us that we might become the people, the church, the household that you have called us to be and might bring glory and fruitfulness for the sake of Christ in this city and in this nation and even to the ends of this earth. So hear us, Lord, and come to us, we pray. Open our eyes and the eyes of our hearts. And may we feed upon your word this day. For Jesus' sake, amen. We sing the hymn on the screens now in reverence and awe we gather around your word.
Well, do please uh, take up your Bibles and uh, open them to the passage that we read in Luke chapter 20, page 879. If you have one of the, uh, the blue Bibles, page 879. And it's a passage, as we'll see, all about the king who is Lord of his temple. Last week, uh, we came back to Luke's gospel and we began to look at this last section, which is the climax uh, of Jesus' long journey to the glory of his coming kingdom. And uh, as we saw, it all centers on Jerusalem and on the temple because uh, the road to Christ's glory must lead him through Jerusalem. And uh, remember we saw that Luke carefully orders uh, the account around two very distinct entries to Jerusalem. Uh, as we'll come to in chapter 22, Jesus sends two disciples on ahead of him to borrow a room so that they can have uh, the Passover together. And there he will tell his disciples privately that this is the climax of his earthly mission. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Savior. And he has come now to achieve his gracious redemption. And he pictures it for them in the Last Supper. And then he fulfills it in his death on the cross. But before that, uh, as we saw last time, uh, Jesus makes a first very public entry into Jerusalem, beginning at chapter 19, verse 28, where likewise, again, he sends two disciples on ahead of him to borrow, this time, a donkey, a colt. And then he enters the city, not as the Lamb of God, but publicly as the Lion of Judah, as the Sovereign, come to announce his glorious rule and to call his people to join him. And yet, as we saw last time, when he comes as king, offering peace to wayward people, even his own people uh, reject him. The most privileged generation of that most favored people, Israel, they reject him and they oppose him. As John says in chapter 1 of his gospel, he came to his own and his own received him not. Many, of course, did. You see in chapter 19, verse 48, many of the people were hanging on his words. But many others, and especially, we're told, the spiritual leaders of the nation, they did not. Look at verse 47 of chapter 19. They wanted to destroy him. He entered the temple. He entered the very heart of Israel's life of faith. But he finds there not the obedience of faith, but the disobedience of sheer unbelief. Indeed, vitriolic, murderous hatred is what he found. It's utterly tragic, isn't it? And yet, it is deeply unsettling. Because that is not just a story that we read all through the history of uh, Israel's religion, and Israel's religious establishment, as we read the Old Testament and as we read into the Gospels. That same attitude, alas, has all too often been the story of the religious establishment in what has called itself the Christian church through these last 2,000 years. And that's what makes this passage today so solemn, so desperately relevant today, just as it was for Luke's first readers. Because Jesus will not tolerate a household that ignores or rebels against its rightful head. Not now. God has been very patient, extraordinarily so, with a recalcitrant people all through the history of the Old Testament ages. That's what you read in the Bible. But now, with the coming of Jesus, a new age has dawned. The kingdom of God has begun on earth in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was Jesus' constant ministry. The kingdom is in the midst of you, because I am now here in the midst of you. The king has come. And so the last days the prophet spoke of, the latter days, it's begun right here on planet earth now. And that's Jesus' whole gospel. The gospel of the kingdom of God is now inaugurated. It's begun in his person. But that means, you see, that there is a new sovereign authority here on earth for the people of God. God's household will be ruled no longer by just the word of Moses and the prophets. Moses was indeed, as Hebrews chapter 2 tells us, Moses was faithful in all God's household as a servant to bear testimony to the things 
that were to be spoken later. But Christ, says the apostle, is faithful over God's household as a son. And we have entered now that age where Christ's personal sovereign rule over his household on earth is being expressed. He rules his people. He rules his church. And that's what Luke is showing us so very plainly here in chapter 20 of his gospel. The king who comes in peace and offering peace is nevertheless the king who is Lord of his temple. And he will assert that sovereign rule now over his household. And what that means is that any institution that claims his name must bow to his authority or else be swept into oblivion. Now, there can hardly be a more pertinent word for the church today, especially in our Western world, can there? So let's have a look at what Luke is teaching us. First of all, look at verses 1 to 8 of chapter 20, where Luke wants us to be very clear that Christ's sovereign authority is decisive for his earthly household in this kingdom age of the latter days. That is, his unique identity confers absolute authority and calls for total obedience in his church. And therefore, resistance to Christ's rule is absolutely inexcusable. Jesus spoke in chapter 19, do you remember, of Jerusalem's blindness and Israel's blindness in the face of his coming. In verse 42, the truth was hidden from their eyes for the most part. They would not see, and so in the end, they could not see. But why is it that people are so blind to the truth about Jesus? Well, I'll tell you. The answer lies in one of the key words of this passage we're looking at now in, verse, in chapter 20. It's the word authority. The authority of Jesus Christ as ruler and Lord. See, spiritual blindness is not a matter of deficient eyes. It's a matter of defiant knees. Knees that will not bow to the authority of Jesus Christ. See, if you will see who Jesus really is, then you will have to submit to him as Lord of all. If he truly is the unique Son of God, then he has absolute and supreme authority. And you have to surrender to him. And that is what people hate. The secular world around us today is enraged at that very thought. How dare we have to listen to what the Bible says about how we're to live? What possible right have you, Jesus, to tell me how to live my life? That's what our society says, isn't it? So we want to get rid of all such things out of the public square. Get rid of all of that teaching out of our schools, out of our campuses, out of our politics. Look at the derision that um, Tim Farron was faced with and becoming leader of the Liberal Democrats when uh, he professed his Christian faith and was derided on the radio and the television. But increasingly, not just in the secular world round about, but the church authorities so often will do the same thing, just a bit more quietly. We won't have Christ's sole authority ruling the roost in our church, no fear. No, we decide how to interpret his words and reinterpret his words. And so we'll silence in the church is what we don't really like, what doesn't really fit. We'll assert our institutional authority over him, not vice versa. Now, friends, that is what we see all around us in the historic churches in the Western world today. But that is not new. It's right here in Luke chapter 20. It goes right back to the beginning. The church authorities, the scribes, the Pharisees, the priests, the elders, verse 1, they challenge Jesus' authority with a question. Now, it's clearly not a genuine question. They want to trap him. They want to damage him. We're told in verse 20 and verse 26 that they keep on doing exactly that. It's just like the Today program on Radio 4, isn't it? It's so tiresome, isn't it? I don't know if you listen in the mornings as I do. I'm getting so fed up with those presenters. They're so full of themselves. And they don't ask genuine questions, do they? They deliberately want to trap somebody into saying something unwise and then exploit it mercilessly for the rest of the day, making news from what's been said so that every bulletin says, oh, so-and-so said on this program, da-da-da-da-da. They want to trap them. 
I've got very fed up with Radio 4 in the morning. I'm moving to Classic FM for a, a pleasant break. I can't stand any more of that stress first thing in the morning. But wouldn't it be great, wouldn't it be great just to have John Humphrey's face just once with the Lord Jesus Christ for an interview? Wouldn't that be good? Well, you see, these religious leaders here tried a John Humphreys, and they got more than they bargained for. Look at verse 2. Who gave you the authority to do the things you do, they said. That is such a typical question of religious establishments. Notice they do not ask, does he speak the truth? Is his ministry uh, spiritually fruitful and obviously being blessed by God? Now, what they ask is, does he have a proper license to do this from us? They don't say, was his cleansing of the temple and his call to repentance right? Was it a true word from God that we should be listening to and responding to? And what they said is, has the presbytery authorized this? Or has the bishop authorized this? Or whatever it might be. Isn't that just so typical of ecclesiastical concerns? Now maybe, of course, it was because to get into the real issues was just too embarrassing, too close to the bone. The last thing that ecclesiastical hierarchies want to talk about, hierarchies want to talk about is actual theology. Some of you will remember a meeting where we saw that ourselves so very clearly, didn't we? People asked denominational officials, well, what do you say about what the Bible teaches? About marriage and sexuality and so on. What was the answer we got? We're not here to talk about theology. Do you remember? All they wanted to discuss was rules and procedures and money and things like that. You see, that is exactly what Luke is showing us here. And it's the tragic truth that religious institutional idolatry can so easily lead people into misguided loyalty that sees them siding against gospel truth, against gospel people, and against the Lord Jesus Christ himself. A clash of authorities, a clash of spiritual loyalties. Is it, when push comes to shove, is it really loyalty to the Christ who rules his temple? Or is it, in fact, loyalty to the temple whose paraphernalia wants to make Christ into the temple's servant? That is such an important question. And it's a question that needs to be asked all the time today. And it's not just religious establishments that need to ask it, not just liberal establishments. It's possible for the very sound and the very orthodox to be just as institutionally hidebound, and often even more so. I'm trying to encourage a young minister at the moment who's having a wonderfully fruitful ministry and a growing church, growing in numbers, and growing in maturity, but constantly he's facing exactly those kind of questions that Jesus was facing here. Where's your proper authority? You haven't jumped through our institutional hoops. But Jesus is the king who is lord of his temple. And he will not be put on the spot by such men. Jesus is not the one in the dock. They are the ones in the dock in his temple. And so he fires back in verse 3. All right then, you tell me about John the Baptist's authority. Was it from God in heaven? Or was it just from man? And with uh, one word, Jesus absolutely snookers them. Because John's sheer moral authority in the nation was universally recognized right across the nation. Everybody knew this man spoke from God. Just as all true God-given authority is self-authenticating. When a man's been chosen by God, when he's been gifted with utterance, when he speaks God's words, not his own words, then people hear the word of God himself with power. He doesn't need to hold up pieces of paper from seminaries and universities and things like that. Totally unnecessary. When people do do that sort of thing to try and give themselves some cre cre uh, credence, people usually don't really find themselves very convinced, do they? But people saw that John's authority was unmissable. It was from God. Look back to uh, Luke chapter 7, just a few pages, just to see, to remind ourselves. Jesus speaks there about John and his ministry. 
Look at verse 24. Jesus says, What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. You see, John was an odd figure. He had no outwardly impressive authoritative credentials or clothes. He had no human authority or splendor like kings or great ones. No. But look at verse 26. What then did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. He was God's messenger to prepare the way for the Lord himself. There could be no greater prophet in the world than that, Jesus says in verse 28, to announce Christ's coming. And he spoke God's words through the prophet Isaiah with scriptural authority, demanding not just that the temple should be cleansed, but that all the people needed to be cleansed and to repent before the Messiah comes. And of course, the people responded en masse, but notice verse 30. Do you see? Not the scribes and the Pharisees, not the leaders. They rejected God's purpose for themselves. They refused John's baptism. Either they didn't believe John or recognize him, or else they saw that they didn't need to repent like these other mere sinful people. So come back to chapter 20, verse 5. Jesus, you see, has them absolutely on the spot. If they admitted that indeed John had come with God's authority, then they exposed their own unbelief. But of course, if they said that he had no such authority, then verse 6, they were in danger, weren't they, of losing all credibility with the people as religious leaders because all the people could see that John manifestly had God's authority. And so they would be exposed as false, false prophets to be stoned. And so they're hoist on their own petard. And they plead ignorance. We don't know, they say. It's just so pathetic, isn't it? But it's just a cloak for their unbelief. But it's so typical of the religious establishment way. It'll live with any fudge, any sort of compromise in order to prop up the institution and keep it going. They'll do everything to avoid talking about truth and authority and just want to keep everything together. Yes, of course we believe in repentance, in theory. But of course we're a broad church, so we need to keep it all together. So we'll, we'll turn a blind eye, Jesus, to this robbery going on in the temple, and to the heresy in the pulpits, and to the immorality in the bedrooms. And we plead ignorance. We just don't know. It's all very, very familiar, isn't it? But how wrong, how foolish. Because Christ's sovereign authority is decisive for his household, for his church in these kingdom latter days. And when those who profess to lead God's household resist his authority and scorn his lordship over his church, Jesus will not enter into negotiations with them for some kind of political settlement. No, Jesus withdraws his word from them, verse 8. He became silent. He will not be used by faithless men. That's what Jesus said back in chapter 19, verse 42. For the people who refused to see, who would not accept his revelation of peace, eventually they could not see. It became hidden from them, hidden from their eyes. God's word of life becomes stopped up and unspoken and withdrawn when his church will not listen to his authority. That's why so many empty church buildings litter our nation today. They are monuments to the unbelief of households of God that have rejected Christ's sovereign authority. Therefore, God has left them to wither and to die because his spirit has been withdrawn because they have forfeited the right any longer to hear his words of life. We need to be clear, friends, the sovereign Lord of heaven will not cast his pearls before swine. Jesus tells us that himself. And it's a, a very solemn word, isn't it, to all of us, to any church that claims the name of Jesus. 
There is one Lord of the church alone, and he claims total obedience from his household. And resistance to his rule, resistance in this kingdom age, well, it's inexcusable, says Jesus. And yet Jesus' silence in verse 8 is both eloquent and pregnant. He doesn't need to answer. Because like John's ministry, his ministry speaks for itself. The people hung on his words of power. The very stones would cry out in praise if these people didn't, Jesus said. It was obvious to all but the most perverse and the most twisted that this man was filled with the goodness and grace of God. Remember what Jesus said back in chapter 6? For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree, says Jesus, is known by its fruit. And the fruit of Jesus' ministry was all around them. But what about the fruit of their ministry? Of God's earthly household Israel, with all its divine privileges and blessings, with their temple that should have showed the living God to the whole world. What about their fruit? Well, Jesus shows again that he's not on the back foot. He is not the one in the dock. And in verses 9 to 18, he goes absolutely on the offensive with a devastating parable that everyone there knew was aimed exactly at them and especially at the religious leaders. And as verse 19 says, it made them want to kill him right there on the spot. The religious leaders might have been too afraid to speak the truth, wouldn't answer Jesus' question, but Jesus is not afraid. This is a cutting parable, and its message is very plain, very plain. And it's this, Christ's sovereign authority over his earthly household will be demonstrated in this kingdom age of the last days. When the church of God rejects the sole lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ, judgment is inevitable. God's calling of a people, you see, a household to bear his name in the world, has always been a call with a purpose. And the purpose is to produce fruit in the world for his glory. It is a call of great grace, a call of great privilege. Moses says that in Deuteronomy 26, verse 18. It's a call to be people of God's treasured possession. But it also confers great responsibilities. You are to keep all his commands. You are to be a people holy to the Lord, said Moses. And Moses taught them back in Deuteronomy chapter 4 that they were to shine the glory of the one true God all the way in the world around. So the people would look at Israel and they would say, what a great God this people must have to have such a wise and understanding people who live like this. That was their calling. It's what the prophets, like Isaiah, repeated again and again. You are my witnesses. You are the people whom I have formed for myself that you may declare my praises to the world, Isaiah 43. That's why God chose Israel as his earthly household. And he chose them to be like Isaiah pictures in chapter 5 of his prophecy, to be a beloved vineyard that he tends with great love. And he looks for it to yield grapes. But God said through Isaiah, I looked, and it yielded only wild grapes, bitter things, useless things. You see, for these people who knew the Scriptures inside out that Jesus is talking to, there was absolutely no doubt at all what Jesus was talking about and who Jesus was talking about. The vineyard owner is God himself. The vineyard is Israel his household, the tenants of the leaders, the scribes and the priests. They know who Jesus is talking to. And first of all, Jesus portrays the crime most vividly. Verse 10, when the owner comes first, he looks for fruit. He sends a servant looking for fruit, and there's none. It's a scandal. But worse than that, the servant he sends is beaten and abused shamefully and cast out. And notice how it goes on, the rebellion getting progressively worse and worse. And yet, the owner keeps sending servants. What patience, what grace he shows. Until verse 13, surely, knowing the risks, 
knowing the history. Still, he sends his own son, notice, his beloved son, saying perhaps they will respect him. What astonishing grace and patience. Would you have done that? Imagine Jesus piercing eyes as he spoke these words to those people. But look at verse 14. What a picture of sheer hatred and of utter irrationality in the hearts of sinful people. To seek to destroy the one nearest and dearest to the heart of the great Lord and Master. There's something so deeply twisted in that, isn't there? I wonder if that's why you find that people who are secular, people who don't for a moment have a thought for God and Christ and the gospel, why so often they seem to like to, to swear, to profane by using the name of Jesus. I wonder if it's just a, some kind of innate, visceral hatred deep in the human heart for the beloved Son of God. That seems to be what it is here. But how can they imagine that they can get away with the crime? And how can it possibly, possibly benefit them as they seem to think in verse 14? Let's kill him and then everything will be ours. Kill Jesus, get rid of God's Son, and then we'll get everything we want in life. It's utterly absurd, isn't it? And yet, isn't that how so many people seem to think today? If only we could get rid of Jesus, if only we could get rid of his cursed presence, his authority, his church, his words, then we'd all be free. Get the Bibles out of the hotel rooms. Get the Bibles out of the classrooms. But friends, that song is a song as old as the world, isn't it? Let's get rid of the owner of this beautiful garden. Let's silence him, and then it'll be ours to do everything we want in our way. We've been singing that song since the Garden of Eden, haven't we? But Jesus' parable shows just how absurd and how deranged, how mad the human heart can really become when it rejects the lordship of the creator and the ruler of this world. And so Jesus spells out very solemnly, having given us the crime, the consequences of such a deep-seated rebellion from the household of God on earth. Verse 19, uh, uh, verse 15. What will the owner do to them? Nothing. You think judgment is inconceivable? Well, verse 16 suggests that is exactly what they thought. Oh, surely no such thing. But what a miscalculation of utterly colossal proportions that is. Look at verse 16. Judgment is as inescapable as it is inevitable. For a people who reject his lordship. Christ's sovereign authority will be demonstrated against the earthly household that bears his name and yet causes his name to be blasphemed and not praised in the world. Read Romans chapter 2. There will be a destruction, says Jesus, of these tenants, verse 16. Just as Jesus had said in chapter 19, as he'll say again in chapter 21, the whole religious apparatus of their temple will be absolutely destroyed. And there'll be a deprivation of their privileged calling. He will give that vineyard to others who will produce fruit. His household on earth will pass away from the most part from Israel and be given over to Gentiles who will produce fruit for his name all over the world. That's what he's saying. The people couldn't believe it. Surely not. Surely God would never judge us like that. Look at verse 17. Jesus fixes them with his eye. And he says, this is not just my word. This is God's holy word from your own scriptures. They tell you this. And he quotes from Psalm 118 that they'd been singing earlier, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But that psalm also speaks, doesn't it, of the king's rejection by the builders, by those who should have been building God's eternal temple. And they reject him, and yet it speaks also of his vindication, that he is not given over to death. 
that arises as the chief cornerstone of the whole of God's building, of his true temple, the everlasting household of all who belong to him through faith in Jesus Christ in this kingdom age of the last days. And so you see, to round off Jesus' word to them, he gives them, in verse 18, a challenge from their own scriptures. For those scriptures gave the same warning as Jesus himself has just given. When a people are confronted with the last and greatest messenger of the covenant, the beloved son, God's king, there are only two possible outcomes. Either they recognize him as Lord, as the cornerstone of salvation, long awaited, and they fall on him so that he breaks their pride and shatters their rebellion, and they enter his true household as they bow to his unique and true authority. He is the cornerstone. Or, says Jesus, if they reject him as the Lord, if they reject him as the true foundation stone of all God's purposes for this world, then he will crush them in judgment. They will be destroyed and dispossessed. Look at verse 18. Do you remember Daniel's dream in chapter 2 of his prophecy of that vivid depiction of the stone not hewn by human hands that will smash and crush every authority of man set up and opposed to the kingdom of the Son of Man? It's the same message. Christ's sovereign authority over his earthly household will be demonstrated in this kingdom age. Either he will be the cornerstone, either he will be the sole authority over everything and everyone, or he must become the crushing stone, the one who will destroy and destroy, notice, especially those who cloak their religious unbelief and their rebellion under some kind of ecclesiastical office. And Jesus will pass their privileges over to others who will bear fruit because they will bow to his authority. And that's why lastly, you see, we shouldn't be surprised at verse 19, which ends this story that Christ's sovereign authority will prove divisive in his earthly household throughout this kingdom age of the last days. Verse 19 tells us that the religious leaders were enraged. They sought to lay hands on him at once to destroy him as they'd already decided to do. They knew Jesus was against them, and they sure as heck were against him. But they feared the people. The people were still hanging on Jesus' words. Some at least, many indeed, were gladly bowing to his lordship over their lives. And you see, division is always inevitable when Christ's lordship and rule is pressed home in his earthly household. When the word of God is not just fired aimlessly off into the ether from the pulpit in pious platitudes, but when it's actually targeted and pressed home into the life of God's household. When, as Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, when he writes to the church in Ephesus and calls it God's institution, when he says, I'm writing to tell you how to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. You see, when Christ's authority tells us in his church we must stop doing this, and we must start doing that, and we must stop saying this, and we must start saying that. When the gospel becomes the force that actually dictates how we do things, and how we must change things, and how we must repent for things in the church, how we must run things, what we must spend our money on, and all the things that concern the house of the church. When Christ's authority demands to hold sway over his church and over our lives, there will be opposition. There will be division. Because some will be humbled and will bow the knee in a new way in loving devotion to the authority of Christ. But others will be hardened to raise their voice, perhaps even raise their fists in resentment, in opposition. But all such opposition will be futile in the end. 
Jesus knew that God's plan and purpose was unstoppable. Indeed, all of their efforts to reject him in this world only ensured his triumph and his victory. It was through their very hatred and, 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 and rebellion against him and opposition to him that would take him to the cross where he won his great victory, where his enemies were defeated, where his true temple was cleansed and changed forever. Evil can only ever be self-defeating, and opposition to the Lordship of Christ can only ever be self-defeating in the end. And that ought to encourage us, together as a church, as well as in our own lives and Christian witnesses. It should put steel into us, too, because if we're truthfully teaching and living the true gospel of Christ's Lordship, we will see division. We will. We can't avoid it. There will be resistance to the absolute rule of Christ from vested interests in the human heart, in our own hearts and others. There are battles raging, aren't there, for control there all the time. But we'll also see it from vested interests in the household of God. And battles will always rage for control there too in His church. There will be divisions provoked by the rule of the real Jesus Christ. And friends, we need to make sure that we are not on the side challenging his authority. We're not the ones asserting vested interests of our own. Remember, Christ's sovereign authority is decisive for his household in this kingdom age. Resistance to him is inexcusable. And we need to remember that his sovereign authority will be demonstrated in this age over churches, over households that reject his lordship. And that must be a clear warning to all of us today, every one of us in every church. A clear warning to every church that claims Jesus is Lord. The purpose of his household, the church, is to bear fruit through being true pillars and buttresses of his true gospel. And if a church, a congregation, a grouping, a denomination, however privileged its history, however great its position, however great its name, if it proves fruitless and rebellious and scorns that authority, well, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them, says Jesus? According to Jesus, he will destroy them and pass their commission to others. Or in other language... He will take away their lampstand of witness and come against them with the sword of his mouth. As Jesus said to the churches of Asia Minor in Revelation 2 and 3. Those churches, by the way, are now long buried, aren't they, under the sands of time. Presumably they didn't take the word of Jesus very seriously and thought he would never judge them. Surely not. What about the church in the Western world today? With all its privileges, all its history, all the provision that we've had from God. Has God's Spirit moved away, east and south, to the teeming millions of Southeast Asia and South America and Africa? Is He giving the vineyard that was once ours to bear fruit into others? When you look around at the historic denominations in the West today, in this country, in the States, in Europe, becoming quite hard not to think so, isn't it? Will our land become like Asia Minor, North Africa, Turkey, the Middle East today? Once a flaming torch of gospel truth for the world, reading the Acts of the Apostles, but now turned to darkness for centuries and centuries? Surely not! Surely not. That's what we want to say too, isn't it? But just like in verse 17, I think Jesus looks us in the eye too. Fixes us with his gaze and says, that's what the scriptures promise. If the king who is Lord of his temple is rejected and ejected from his household. If his writ is ignored and his rule is scorned. Very solemn, isn't it? None of us dare presume 
on the grace of God. No person who calls himself a Christian. No church that calls itself a Christian church. He will demonstrate his sovereign authority, both in blessing and in judgment. Because Jesus is Lord. Lord of his church on earth. Lord of our lives here on earth. He alone has power and authority, splendor and dignity. So, friends, God is saying to us today, bow to his mastery. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you are a God who speaks to us, not in riddles, but in plain truth. We thank you that you are a God of grace who warns us for our blessing and for our good. So help us, we pray, to be those who hang upon your words, who receive your words, and who fall upon you as the great cornerstone, the Lord of our lives and the Lord of the church. Guard us, keep us, we pray, under your great and gracious sovereign rule until the Lord Jesus comes again. And may we be a people who bear fruit in your vineyard and so bring pleasure to your heart and blessing to this world. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, after this solemn word, we sing together a prayer, number 541 in our blue book. So, breath of life, come breathe within us, renewing thought and will and heart. Come love of Christ, afresh to win us, revive your church in every part. Number 541. Let's pray. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.